Welcome everybody back to the Damage Report. It's Thursday, I'm John Arola. We got a big show. Not only is a fairly legendary director Robert Greenwald going to be in the studio to talk about his new documentary, Suppress the Fight to Vote, which I recently watched and found to be incredibly powerful and also terrifying. We're gonna be talking about that. Andy Z is gonna be joining us once again on the show to talk about Refuse Fascism's new national campaign. We've got news from around the world. We've got AOC interviewing fairly harshly Mark Zuckerberg and really showing Facebook's new policy in regards to political advertising on Facebook to be pretty ridiculous. And more on the impeachment, the Republicans storming the rooms, all of that. And we're gonna get that in just a sec. I just wanna briefly say, it's sort of a weird thing. I guess partially just because I don't think I've ever seen a news show start with something like this. It doesn't really matter, but I'm kind of depressed. You know, not not in the normal sense, just from the news, like just personally, like a little bit depressed, a little bit off, a little bit not myself. And it doesn't really matter, it's nothing terrible, but um, it's probably gonna color my commentary and my enthusiasm for the story. So if you notice that, uh, just full disclosure, I imagine it happens to people who report on the news and comment on the news a lot, and we don't ever say it. So yeah, just a little bit depressed, so spare that in mind. Anyway, thank you. Uh, with that, why don't we launch into the news, starting off with uh, an update on Donald Trump and the impeachment inquiry. We now know from the past few weeks a lot about what Donald Trump and Giuliani and Sondland and others, Rick Perry, were trying to get done when it comes to Ukraine. We have the call transcript, we have the text messages, we now have testimony from another number of people including William Taylor. But there was something in that testimony that made me think, let's stop for one sec and let's think about how this could have gone down. We're seeing every day the way it is actually proceeding, but how could it have gone down? And William Taylor in his testimony actually describes something that's kind of chilling when you think about it. So I wanna read two little sections of that. And so here's what William Taylor said earlier this week. He said, on September 7th, I had a conversation with Mr. Morrison, in which he described the phone conversation earlier that day between Sondland and President Trump. Mr. Morrison said that he had a quote, sinking feeling after learning about this conversation from Ambassador Sondland. According to Mr. Morrison, President Trump told Ambassador Sondland that he was not asking for a quote, quid pro quo. But President Trump did insist that President Zelensky go to a microphone and say he is opening investigations of Biden and the 2016 election interference, and that President Zelensky should want to do this himself. Mr. Morrison said that he told Ambassador Bolton and the NSC lawyers on his phone call between President Trump and Ambassador Sondland. So again, it's ridiculous for Trump to claim there that it's not a quid pro quo. He wants him to do this specific thing and he's conditioned military aid specifically on that. That's the definition of a quid pro quo. Um, But it's about the announcement and Zelensky doing it himself. And we have more details on that. The following day on September 8th, Ambassador Sondland and I spoke on the phone. He said he had talked to President Trump as I had suggested a week earlier. But that President Trump was adamant that President Zelensky himself had to quote, clear things up and do it in public. President Trump said it was not a quid pro quo. Ambassador Sondland said that he had talked to President Zelensky and Mr. Yermak and told them that, although this was not a quid pro quo, if President Zelensky did not quote, clear things up in public, we would be at a quote, stalemate. Which is, I'm not murdering you, I just want my knife back from your chest. Anyway, I understood, this is again William Taylor, not my commentary. I understood a stalemate to mean that Ukraine would not receive the much needed military assistance. Ambassador Sondland said that this conversation concluded with President Zelensky agreeing to make a public statement in an interview with CNN. So again, not a quid pro quo, except you won't get the aid unless you do this specific thing. You know the stakes and so you will agree to do it. So it was a quid pro quo and a successful one up to that point. But the thing I wanna focus on here, is not the fact that it's a quid pro quo, we understand that, we've understood it for a long time. But that last bit there about the CNN interview, which I guess has been out there, but I don't think people have really focused on it. So think about what could have actually happened. And we've got the script, we can go to that in in just a little bit. So if the whistleblower hadn't brought this up, if there hadn't been the investigation, if the text messages hadn't come out, if because of that William Taylor didn't give his testimony, if Sondland hadn't confirmed effectively that it was a quid pro quo, if all of that hadn't happened and all of this was, as was planned, still secret, what you would have had either already or in a week or in a few months, maybe in six months, you would have had CNN announce We have an interview with the president of Ukraine. Very exciting, tune in, 
We'll see what happens. We're gonna talk about how this comedian turned into a president. It should be really entertaining TV. And then at some point in that interview, the president of Ukraine, seemingly of his own volition, would have brought up, oh, and by the way, we're launching an investigation of how Joe Biden interfered in the 2016 election with the help of Ukrainian politicians and businessmen. And we're really concerned about the corruption of Joe Biden. And so we're looking into it, that's the thing that we're doing, it's just us. And we take corruption seriously, and so we're investigating Joe Biden. And that would have happened maybe later on the primary, maybe during the general election. And Donald Trump would have had no connection to it whatsoever. Because in none of this planning, was there anything about a joint announcement? It would have been totally hidden. It would have just been a country starts an investigation of the guy running for president. That was the plan. It could have happened. For all we know, there are other plans that haven't been revealed, that aren't being investigated right now, that we don't have the text messages, we don't have the call transcript. We know that there were a lot of really scary phone calls. That's what the brave sources from inside the White House have revealed. They haven't actually given us those transcripts, but they have said that scary stuff has been said. So imagine if that had actually happened. And in fact, it was so specific, as I alluded to earlier, that they had an idea of the specific thing he was gonna say on CNN. So I'm jumping ahead here. Special attention should be paid to the problem of interference in the political processes of the United States, especially with the alleged involvement of some Ukrainian politicians. I want to declare that this is unacceptable. This would be the president on CNN. We intend to initiate and complete a transparent and unbiased investigation of all available facts and episodes, including those involving Burisma and the 2016 US elections. And let's just stop and acknowledge how amazing it is that CNN was chosen for this. Now CNN, for all I know, had no involvement in this, that no interview was actually planned. But the goal was to do this on CNN. That is the news source that Donald Trump refers to as fake news. And what he was trying to do was make that true. He was trying to make CNN be the purveyor of literal fake news, a fake investigation over a fake conspiracy theory to help out Donald Trump's electoral chances. And thankfully, we found out about it. But otherwise, this would have just happened and very serious journalists all you know, all across the media would be reporting on this as a serious thing. Oh My God, what is this gonna do to Joe Biden's chances? Like Joe Biden dipping a couple points in the polls, kind of understandable, all this corruption talk, all this investigation talk. That's what would have happened. I mean, the right wing would have gone mad. It would be the only thing you would have heard of. Sean Hannity probably would have known the origin of this, but he wouldn't have revealed it because he likes to hide things because he has no journalistic ethics literally whatsoever. But that's what could have actually happened. And all under the guise supposedly of they're really interested in corruption, they really care about it. Small little side story that that made a little blip in the news, but that nobody really cares about. Uh, Trump administration sought billions of dollars in cuts to programs aimed at fighting corruption in Ukraine and elsewhere. But don't let that interfere with the narrative about the fact that this has nothing to do with his re-election campaign. It's just about corruption. They're just cutting billions of dollars from fighting corruption in that country and others. So anyway, we have averted that potential future, but that was what they were going for. And imagine how powerful it could have been if the whistleblower hadn't initially raised his concerns. Okay, with that, we're gonna jump to a related story from yesterday. I'm a little bit late at getting to this, but just bear with me. So. Yesterday, Matt Gates, you're seeing him right there, and dozens of Republicans stormed the secure location in the basement of the House of Representatives because of how concerned they were about the way this impeachment inquiry is being conducted. What's ironic about that, amidst all of their calls that how dare they bar all of us from being here, we wanna know what's going on. We just wanna be a part of the process, is that a significant number of those people in that literal protest are a part of the process. Sarah Mims reports that 12 of the Republicans who protested are actually on the committees doing the impeachment investigation. So they could already get into that sensitive compartmented information facility that they broke into if they wanted to. They're already on it. Now, she did correct to say, it turns out it's 11, 12 of them RSVP'd, but one didn't show up. I totally get it, I live in LA, it's hard to get people to actually come up to come to your events. I understand that, but 12 of them, Or like, it is shocking that they will not let us know what's going on. Hold on, I actually gotta go to a committee meeting. I'm involved in the impeachment inquiry. I'll be back and then I'll complain about it later on in Fox News. So they have tons of people. It's almost even in these committees actually, Democrats and Republicans. But they have to pretend that somehow it's just Adam Schiff and like food services or something. That's all that's in there. The witness Adam Schiff, 
That's it, it's not, it's Republicans. It's not Matt Gates. he's not on these committees. If he wanted to, it would be easy to fix as AOC gets to in just a second. But this is all about presenting the narrative that the process is objectionable in some fashion. Never talk about the substance, don't talk about whether a crime was actually committed. Don't talk about our obligation to take these sorts of abuses of power by the president and his diplomats, whether official or unofficial, seriously. Just make up ideas about the process and hide the fact that the literal people standing behind you during this photo op could, if they wanted to, just be in the room without breaking down the door. So AOC responded to this saying, what's worse, since many of the flash mob already sat on the committees, they knew how serious a breach it was to bring devices like cell phones into that SCIF, and they did it anyways. Our country is a game to them. Remember that the next time they use national security as an excuse for their bad ideas. And, and I, I get that in this SCIF room, you're not supposed to bring the cell phones and everything. I get that. I don't really care about that part of the story. I care more about how ridiculous it is that a very serious impeachment inquiry, which should be one of the most serious times in US government, especially considering what we already know about what Donald Trump did, is being turned into a game. And not accidentally, it's not just that these Republicans tried to do a serious protest and came off like children. The goal was to make this seem like a land of buffoons that you don't have to take any of this seriously. And so the more Jacob Woley and their tactics become, it actually benefits them to push the narrative that this isn't something that serious Americans need to take seriously. Uh, one other comment there, Alexandra Casa Cortez says, important to remember that GOP and Dem members have been part of impeachment depositions this whole time. All you need to do is sit on the relevant committees. If these guys are so mad, maybe they should take their little flash mob to the GOP leader who didn't assign them to the task. Yeah, just go ask to be put onto the committee if you want. You got tons of people. I'm gonna go just a little bit over because I want you to know that there is at least one voice still on Fox News that is trying to get people to think rationally about this process. Andrew Napolitano, who was instrumental actually accidentally in Shep Smith getting booted from Fox News, he had this to say on Fox and Friends. As frustrating as it may be to have these hearings going on behind closed doors, the hearings over which Congressman Schiff is presiding, they are consistent with the rules. They can make any of the rules they want. Well, they can't change the rules, they follow the rules. And when were the rules written? Last, in January of 2015. And who signed them? John Boehner. And who enacted them? A Republican majority. These are not the impeachment hearings. The impeachment hearings have to be held in public by the House Judiciary Committee. This is the initial interview of witnesses to see what they have to say to determine whether or not they are even worthy of, of presenting evidence of impeachment. And they will continue to go on and on and on until they find something on the president. Yes, right? that's what police and prosecutors do. They come to a conclusion that the person is probably guilty, and then they look for evidence to support or to negate that. That's what Congressman Schiff is doing, and he's following the rules. So there, Ainsley Earhart tries to pretend that we don't know anything. It's absurd, but that's what she's paid to say. But more importantly, yeah, these rules, if you had an issue with them, you should have brought it up sometime in the last four years after the Republicans put them into effect. You didn't have a problem with them then, Fox and Friends. You only have a problem with them now, now that they're targeting a Republican. And second of all, yeah, we're we're still in the very early phase of this impeachment inquiry. Donald Trump is not about to get voted out of office tomorrow. And they understand that Matt Gates knows that he doesn't care again. This isn't about a legitimate concern that he's not involved in the process, which would not be legitimate because he's just not on the committee that actually deals with it. It's about trying to fool people into discounting this as early in the process as possible. Thankfully, their stunt yesterday appears to have backfired against them. But you can expect that they're going to retreat and then regroup and come back with some more BS to try to confuse the American people. It's gonna be on responsible members of the media to make sure that they know what's actually going on. And Napolitano did a pretty good job of laying it out right there. Okay, with that, we are gonna take a break. We come back, we're gonna be talking about voter suppression and a new documentary after this. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be. Featuring in-depth research, razor sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. 
But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. You might recall in the last uh, midterm election, the gubernatorial race in Georgia where Stacey Abrams narrowly lost to uh, Brian Kemp. Hopefully, you also remember that in the months and years leading up to that election, a lot of concerns about voter suppression, uh, both in Georgia and around the country. Uh, those concerns are incredibly well documented in a new documentary, Suppressed the Fight to Vote. And we're joined now by uh, the man who brings you that documentary, uh, director and founder, president of Brave New Films, Robert Greenwald. Welcome to the studio. Thank you. Good to be with you again. Uh, great to have you here. Uh, so, um, as I alluded to earlier in the show, uh, I just watched it, and I am incredibly frustrated about what you reveal. So, for people who might not be that intimately familiar with that race and the context of voter suppression, give us a basic idea of what was going on. The basic idea that we discovered in the great team at Brave New Films as we worked on this for a year was it wasn't one thing. It wasn't the Ku Klux Klan. It wasn't some bad guy. It was a whole series of tactics that we used. Mm -hmm. So as I would really grab me, how many hours would you wait to vote? Uh, I've never had to wait more than an hour and I voted in three different states. I like to think that I would last two, three, maybe. Four, five, six hours, we have people. How you lose far a lot would, of people at that point. Of course, absolutely, and it's by design. How far would you travel if you didn't have a car and you didn't have public transportation? Because they close polling places as a specific effort yeah. to reduce the vote. How much time would you take off work if it cost you money? Because of the various tactics that we use. So we go into all of these, and I think most importantly, what we do and hopefully do well, we put a face on policy. Mm -hmm. Voter suppression is an abstract idea, it's an important idea. But what we try to do is personalize it. We found these incredible, patriotic, in the best sense of the word, Americans mm -hmm. in Georgia, whose only uh, crime, if you will, was wanting to vote. And the steps that were put in front of them, the hurdles that were put in front of them, I think are important for all of us who care about our country, who care about democracy, and that's why we made the film. Well, so you said you wanted to put a face to this. Uh, one of the faces that seems pretty important in this is uh, Brian Kemp himself. Uh, and he is one of, it's not, he's not the only instance of this, uh, the guy who's in charge of the elections, who's running in the election, as, as it's put in the documentary, it's, You've got the umpire playing in the game. Doesn't seem like it should be legal. Um, you, you talk about some potential reforms that are going on. Does that seem like one of the things that hypothetically should be considered? As my uh, nephew would say, duh, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Mm -hmm. It should be considered and many things need to be considered. I think what we try to do with the film, and the film by the way is available for free, mm -hmm. our goal is 2020 by 2020, mm -hmm. 2020 screenings by the 2020 election. Mm -hmm. Because this is a tool for people. <clears throat> we fail if people don't use it. We fail if people don't screen it. But if they screen it, whether it's in the home, in the church, we have educational programs, mm -hmm. people are screening it in bookstores, bowling alleys, then we have a chance to reach people energize them and then they will take action. Yeah, well, let's make sure that people know where they can find it. So where should they head to, to take a look? Bravenewfilms.org, it's there, it's free. There's a study guide if you wanna show it in school. There's a reflection guide if you wanna show it in a place of worship. Okay. There's a guide if you wanna show it in your home. And again, thanks to the incredible support of our funders, there are 16, 17,000 who give us small amounts of money. We are able to make it free yeah. all over the country. So let's let's be really clear about <coughs> what's revealed here. Uh, as we were talking about before we went live, 
Um, you go through a number of different efforts at voter suppression, the long lines, closing down the polling places, moving them far away, uh, issues with provisional ballots, issues with students being able to vote, like one after the other after the other. And for each of these, you talk about some numbers. And so it feels hard to come away from this documentary and not feel that mission accomplished, it was a stolen election. Is that, is that fair to say? Yes, it was a legally stolen election. They mm -hmm. didn't mess with the voting machines, although they may have. What we prove in the film, and look, I'm a New Yorker. I'm cynical by birth <laughs> and upbringing. I wasn't sure when we began. I thought, well, maybe we'll do a three or four minute piece and that there are one or two or a small number of people. As Lori did the research and she and Casey kept coming into the office, I mean, the number of stories that were available to us of people who had been suppressed and who wanted to talk about it mm -hmm. because they didn't want it happening to other people. So it grew and grew and grew and it became <clears throat> factually clear. And, and Stacey Abrams says it in her speech, factually clear that the number of votes that were suppressed were mm -hmm. far beyond what she would have needed to win yeah. the election. You know, it, I, I know that you know, between the left and the right, between Democrats and Republicans, we, we obviously disagree about a lot of different issues. We have ideological differences when it comes to some significant things. But I guess one, one area that I'm still sort of naive, even at this mm -hmm. age, is it feels like we should all agree on democracy. We should all agree that people should be allowed to vote, that it should be made literally as easy as it's possible for us to make it. But clearly, we don't agree about that, and very few politicians Use that. Like, there's no cost as a Republican politician to be to being effectively against democracy, to suppressing the vote, purging voters, all of that. It never seems to hurt them. How do we change that situation? How do we get it to matter if you're on the side of democracy or if you're vigorously opposed to democracy? Well, I think that's a good way, and we talk about it that way. You know, we talk about patriotism. We use patriotic music. I mean, to make it clear that that's the side we are on. There are some people who are, you know, politics has become tribal to some degree. Mm -hmm. And if you identify with your tribe, there's almost nothing you can do to change those people. But there are a small, small percentage. There's a mm -hmm. huge, larger group out there of people who I think do believe in democracy, who believe that the right thing should happen. And those are the ones we want to reach to say yeah. that this is going on today. You know. Some days, I mean, it's tough working on this kind of material for days and days and days. But I would leave the editing room and I really would think, is this about the United States of America in this year? Mm -hmm. After all that's gone on, the people whose lives have been lost, people have been killed in the fight for voting rights. And here we are now yeah. having to fight this fight again. And what the politicians are doing, they are trying to choose who are the voters, mm -hmm. not who the voters can choose. Mm -hmm. Politicians trying to make the choice. Yeah, 100%. And while uh, you know most of the film, dark, concerning, uh, you do end with a positive note. And so I think it's only fitting that this interview should end with a positive note. Um, as you said, uh, you, want, you want as many screenings of this as possible. So I mean, obviously anybody watching this should go watch uh, Suppress the Fight to Vote. Right now. <laughs> right, watch it right now. Uh, but also, uh, if you can organize a screening, organize a screening, as, as you just said, it can be anywhere. Um, get some people together. If this sort of thing frustrates you, if you don't want to see it in the future, the best possible way to do that is to get people to think about and start to act based on this material. So uh, Robert Greenwald, I mean, obviously you've got a great history of amazing documentaries, but uh, this in particular, incredibly timely, incredibly important. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, go check it out. Uh, we're gonna take a quick break here. Uh, when we come back, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's testimony before Congress, uh, harsh questioning from many, including Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. We'll have excerpts from that after this. Yesterday, head of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, was going before Congress, and he received incredibly harsh questioning about a number of different topics involved in you know, Facebook's leadership, who they're partnering with, and all of that. AOC, in particular, had some tough questions for Zuckerberg, especially around this topic of how much fact checking will Facebook do, and how much will they allow politicians to get away with? Here's a little bit of that. Would I be able to run advertisements on Facebook targeting Republicans in primary, saying that they voted for the Green New Deal? 
I mean, if you're not fact-checking political advertisements, I'm just trying to understand the, the bounds here. What's fair game? Congresswoman, I, uh, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. I think So probably. you don't know if I'll be able to do that? I think probably. Um, do you see a potential problem here with a complete lack of fact-checking on political advertisements? Well, Congresswoman, I think lying is bad, and I think if you were to run an ad that had a lie, that would be bad. That's different from it being, uh, from it, from the, for in our position, the right thing to do to prevent uh, your constituents or people in an election from seeing that you had lied. So that is, it's an amazing question, and I love his response. Well, I think lying is bad, just not as bad as being unprofitable. Because of course, it's not like he or Facebook is just some sort of like, we're just sitting by and we're watching this and I don't wanna get involved. They're involved, they're getting paid for these advertisements. And so when you pretend to have a principle, but you're getting paid behind that principle, I think a reasonable person gets to question whether or not you're actually in it for the principle or whether you're in it for the paycheck that you're cashing to spread disinformation. Even at the cost, not the hypothetical cost, we already know the effect that this can have, the cost of potentially swinging an election. I mean, think about how much disinformation, uh, willful lies there were in the 2016 election on Facebook. And now their response after years of serious study is, we don't wanna get involved. And if there's known lies, we don't care. Because what she said right there was not, what if I ran an ad that said that in a Republican primary, one candidate was dumb? Or, you know, doesn't have a good enough connection with their family? These sorts of like opinion things or exaggeration things. She stated a very specific, verifiable fact. Did this person vote for the Green New Deal or did they not vote for the Green New Deal? And he confirmed, yes, you would probably be fine with that. And he says probably, which makes it seem as if not necessarily, but based on everything else he has said, including more that we're gonna show you in this video, yeah, AOC could just do that. She could tank any Republican she wants to tank their numbers by making it seem as if they support whatever. Let's say, um, you know, what if uh, Adam Schiff ran an ad saying that a Republican was a member of the Democratic Socialists of America or whatever, you could just do it. Doesn't matter, Facebook's not gonna get involved. They think that free speech is important. I mean, they don't like lying or anything, but they're not gonna get involved with actual fact checking. And again, everyone who defends this, including Mark Zuckerberg, are going to say this is about free speech. And you know, it's not on us to decide if something is technically true or not. She gave an incredibly specific, verifiable fact. Did this thing happen or did it not happen? It's on the official record, you can go check it. They choose not to and they get paid. But just to make sure she gave him an opportunity to realize how ridiculous he was being, let's see if he took the bait. So you won't take down lies or you will take down lies? I think it's just a pretty simple yes or no. Congresswoman, uh, in- I'm not talking about spin, I'm talking about actual in, Yes, in most cases in a democracy, okay. I believe that people should be able to see for themselves what politicians that they may or may not vote for so are you saying won't take judge them their down. character for themselves. So you won't take, you may flag that it's wrong, but you won't take it down. Congresswoman, it's, uh, it, it depends on the context that it shows up, organic post ads, okay. the, the treatment is a little One bit question. Okay, so no, no, they're not going to, the, the, the organic ad, no, they're not going to, they don't care, they're not interested. I think that it's on the people to decide if what I am being paid to tell them is true is true. You don't think that Facebook running a paid advertisement from an elected politician in the US government doesn't give it some sort of air of authenticity, people aren't going to believe what they see online. Like I, I, I grew up believing great things about the potential for humanity and what they could accomplish. And most of that has been proven to be untrue as I've gotten older. Here's the thing, people believe what they read online. The older they are, the more they believe about what they see. Donald Trump is not going to exploit this at some point in the future. He is already spending countless millions of dollars in Facebook specific advertisements because he knows that the predominantly older audience that's on Facebook believes what they see and votes based on it. And right now it's, you know, it's stuff attacking the Democrats. It's not as horrible as it could be. He could start to really stretch the bounds of that. I mean, if he, if Zuckerberg is saying that we're not gonna fact check what politicians say, do you think that he's gonna be more or less willing to fact check the President of the United States? 
especially in an environment where he's having meetings with conservatives like Tucker Carlson and others about supposed bias against right wingers on that site. Do you think he's gonna take a stand against the president? If Trump starts spreading on Facebook advertisements, the sort of conspiracy theories that he casually mentions in Chopper Talk, do you think that they're gonna take those down? Do you especially think they're gonna take those down if they're making millions of dollars a week to keep them up? No, nobody thinks that, nobody thinks that at all. And the thing is, Mark Zuckerberg wants to pretend that he's just still has this like fun social media site and it's really not on him. No, they have made very specific choices during the history of Facebook to try to accrue as much powerful power as they possibly can. And as mind boggling as it might be, they have been successful in that. And although it sucks that we're in a position where any social media site, let alone Facebook, could be helping to influence the way a federal election, an election for president goes, that's where we're at. That's what we've got right now. And until we convince more people to leave Facebook, that's where we're gonna be. And so their their policy towards advertisements by politicians, by fact checking is incredibly important. There is little that could be more important. And so great credit to AOC for doing the harsh questioning that she did. Uh, This needs to be just the beginning though, not the end of the pressure that's put on Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook to change this horrendous policy. Because again, we've said this a million times, but I'll say it again. If one side is willing to lie and the other side isn't, then a system that is agnostic to the truth has chosen a side and it's with the liars and it matters. Okay, we're gonna take a short break, we come back, lots more to get to. Right now, in a small number of conference rooms in Washington, D.C., the impeachment inquiry against the president is proceeding. But outside of those, in the streets of a number of cities around the United States, there are protests being led against Donald Trump and his regime and what it stands for. And we're joined now by one of the initiators of those protests, Andy Z of RefuseFascism.org. Welcome back to the show. Thank you, John. Good to be on again. Uh, great to have you on, and it seems like a timely time to have you on because uh, right now your uh, hashtag out now protests are going on. Can you tell us about those protests? Sure, it did turn out to be uh, an excellent time, even as we called it right before the impeachment inquiry was announced. Uh, we are beginning this Saturday nationwide protests under the uh, name uh, hashtag out now. And uh, We began last weekend with two protests to announce this in Los Angeles at Santa Monica and in New York City. And the basic demand of this, it's a very simple demand which should be able to unite everybody who is upset about children in cages, children being separated from their parents, who's concerned about what the Trump administration is doing to the climate, who's concerned about the uh, uh, the, the danger of nuclear war. Because as I've said in that speech, you just showed a little video of that this itchy Twitter, Twitter finger is yeah. on the nuclear trigger right now. Everybody concerned about this can be united around a very simple demand, the Trump Pence regime must go, the whole regime must go and we could do this. But it can only happen if we do the kind of protests that you see now in Hong Kong and in Puerto Rico and actually about 15 countries around the world where people have taken to the streets in unrelenting and sustained protests determined to win their demand. This we're trying to start through five weeks of protests. And as I said, we began in Santa Monica and New York last week, and we could perhaps talk about that a bit too. Yeah, actually, why don't, why don't we do that? Because I had, I had read the news that at Santa Monica, a, a group was attacked by apparently a Trump supporter with bear spray. I actually didn't know at the time that this was the group that was attacked. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, actually, you know what happened is people, and this is important. First, they went out on the beach and spelled out Trump, Trump Pence out now, and you can watch the drone video of this. But it wasn't just one person, it was about a dozen of these fascist thugs who came out and they were circling, circling, circling. And one of the things that they were chanting was, you want a civil war, we'll bring you a civil war. And this is something people have to take very seriously because I'm the organization that I speak for and that I co-founded with Cornell West and Carl Dix and and a number of other people uh, is called refusefascism.org. And uh, this 
these people are very determined to bring about a fascist America. And we're approaches by saying in the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. So after this protest, people went up to the Santa Monica Pier and they were gonna do a die in. It's sort of a symbolic announcement of what's starting in cities across the country in small towns this weekend. So they were gonna do the die in and these dozen fascists with their American flags on poles at a certain point came across and started striking people with their flagpoles. And then two of them whipped out bear repellent, which is potentially lethal. And they sprayed it in people's eyes and their faces, and they went directly after the leaders of this march. Now, one of them was eventually arrested. But what has to be understood here is that when you have fascist mobs that have not only come after our organization, particularly our leaders, uh, and in fact, some of these people were in New York as well. And, and when I started speaking the clip you showed, they started to rush the stage, but there was enough people in the audience that they pushed them back. Um, but you have to understand when you have fascist mobs that are doing that, when you have a president whose words have inspired people to commit mass murder against Latinos in two different cities, against Jews in Pittsburgh, uh, in, against, and then this movement had begun before that against gay people in Florida. When you have this kind of thing, when you have fascist mobs in the street combined with fascist legislators, let's, this is not that these people didn't know the rules about this. This is a group of people, an entire, and why we say the word regime, this is an entire Republican party that has been hollowed out and is now a fascist party. Okay, no, they're not wearing brown shirts, they're wearing suits and ties. But that actually, so does Erdogan in Turkey and so does Orban in Hungary. This is fascism in the 21st century. People need to understand the actual lessons of this and stop it before it's too late. Voter suppression, Mr. Greenwald, is just a part of that. But here's the question, are Americans gonna take the streets in this kind of way? And we've tr tried to provide and we are providing starting this week in a very straightforward way for people to get out into the streets. We'll start every weekend, it won't be every day. It'll be every weekend, get out there. Whether you are a Bernie supporter or you're a Democrat or you're an independent or you're a revolutionary like myself, all of us need to be in the streets together to get out there and demand that the entire regime be gone. And yes, we should start with Donald Trump, but that's not where it stops. Well, uh, it's a very powerful call, and uh, like you said, you're you're attempting to make it as straightforward as possible. And so, uh, anyone who's interested in this, concerned about the direction that the country has been going in, uh, definitely take a look at this. Uh, RefuseFascism.org is the name, but also a site where you get information. Um, Andy Z, uh, as always, uh, thank you so much, and both good luck in the protests, but also stay safe because, as you point out, there's a lot of threat coming at uh, protesters in a variety of different forms. That's right, John, so I do thank you for that. Right now, the website to go to is refusefascism.org and that it says out now across the top. Awesome, thank you so much, Andy. Really All right, appreciate thanks it. a lot, John. Okay, bye bye. Uh, we're gonna take a short break, we come back, we're actually gonna be talking about one of those international protests that Andy referred to uh, earlier. Uh, that is the protest going on in Chile right now, uh, but more uh, news from around the world in meanwhile in. And now it's time for news from around the world. This is Meanwhile In. <music> Meanwhile, around the world, Coca-Cola deserves some recognition for winning an award two years running. Coca-Cola was found for the second year in a row to be the most polluting brand in a global audit of plastic trash conducted by the Break Free From Plastic global movement. The giant soda company was responsible for more plastic litter than the next top three polluters combined, which is difficult. So kudos, let's bring up a graphic and you're gonna see the comparison of the three. And Coca-Cola, huge there, and you won't be surprised with some of the other names. As always, PepsiCo just lagging behind Coca-Cola in taste and litter this time. This is basically done by, they get tens of thousands of volunteers to comb mostly beaches, I think other areas as well, and pick up plastic trash. They identified bits of plastic, bits of plastic from 8,000 different brands, but some of them definitely stood out. And Coca-Cola, which loves to say that it's being much more environmentally conscious and all of that. Some of that might theoretically be true. Also behind the scenes fighting against legislation to make that sort of littering less likely. Uh, great job in getting the award twice in a row. Maybe do something about your littering. Pass that off the award to a different company next year. It would be nice to see some switch up in there. Meanwhile, in. 
Meanwhile, in Brazil, although many people have moved on from the fires in the Amazon, the threat of the Amazon somehow continues. Soaring deforestation coupled with the destructive policies of Jair Bolsonaro could push the Amazon rainforest dangerously to an irreversible tipping point within two years, a prominent economist has said. After this point, the rainforest would stop producing enough rain to sustain itself and would start slowly degrading into a drier savanna, releasing billions of tons of carbon into the atmosphere. And so some people think that it might be 15 years, it might be 20 years before that happens, but new scientific analysis implies that it could just be a couple of years away. And to give you an idea of how this is being achieved, Brazil's Space Research Institute reported that deforestation in August was 222% higher than in August of last year. That is amazing. It is amazing what you can accomplish when you are elected on a platform of destroying the Amazon, wiping out indigenous tribes that might exist in there just to provide a little bit more land for grazing cattle and a little bit more lumber. Jair Bolsonaro has a difficult quest to kill the Amazon during his first term, but I think he's gotten off to a great start in that. Meanwhile, in <music> Meanwhile, Chile is more than two weeks into massive protests, significant protests that have already left 18 people at the very least dead. More than 5,000 have been detained, hundreds have been injured already. Uh, Edwin actually provided for me a, a journalist who, uh, pro, who did a little summary of what these protests are about. Here's a section of that. On Saturday, President Sebastián Piñera sent troops into the streets and the military declared an 8 p.m. curfew in Santiago. That night, social media users uploaded videos of police and soldiers shooting at civilians. They're trying to stop a movement that started with high school students protesting a subway fare increase. For five days, students in Santiago stormed subway stations. Chilean police responded with violence. Someone who earns the minimum wage and takes one round trip on the subway per day spends approximately 17% of their income on subway fares. We left that section on the end of the video there to give you an idea that the fare increase actually is very significant for an already overpriced system. That is a Christian Rossell, by the way, who has a two part series explaining not just what's going on right now in the protest, but puts it in historical context of past governments of Chile and also the US's involvement in that as well. So head to Christian Rossell's Twitter account. You can find those two videos embedded there for a lot more information and a lot more understanding of the region than I could possibly provide. But I did want to talk a little bit more about this because social media is awash with videos of people peacefully protesting and also people being brutalized by the police. Edwin shared with me a video of a guy being shot in the leg. It looked like possibly with something non-lethal, but it's hard to say exactly because he was beset by police and started being beaten right after that. There's videos, it might have been a part in there of cops running through the streets firing shotguns at people. They're firing lethal rounds at protesters. So when I say that hundreds have been injured, 18 have been killed, this isn't some like mystery, like how did it come to this? How did this happen? Almost immediately after the protests began, the violence from the regime started to be directed at those protesters. And in part due to that actually, what initially began as a generally student led protest over the fare increase has widened to a number of different concerns, all effectively being generated by the insane out of control levels of wealth and income inequality in Chile. It's as Andy was saying earlier in the show, it's the same sort of story we've effectively seen in a number of different cities around the globe. People are fed up, they're not gonna take it any longer. And it's unfortunate that at the same time that they're rising up, you can see it in London, in Lebanon, in Hong Kong, in all of these cities, governments are showing an increased willingness to employ force, including lethal force against these protesters, even if they are 100% peaceful. Now, just today, actually, the president announced an increase in wages, social payments, subsidies on energy and medicine, and apologized for a lack of vision in tackling pent up frustration in Chile. But almost immediately, both economists looking at the amount of money that was being provided by these changes and many of the protesters have responded by saying, this is not nearly enough to take out the concerns that people have in these different areas. It's almost like a token payment and some people are responding with even more rage that their justified passion 
is attempting to be co-opted with effectively breadcrumbs when they're asking for much more fundamental changes. So you know, as we've said for the protesters in Hong Kong, we say to the protesters in Chile, you're showing incredible bravery in fighting for much needed change, but stay safe at the same time because there are certainly people literally gunning for you in this case. Okay, that's all the time we have, unfortunately. Thank you so much for joining me today. It was obviously a big show. Go take a look at the documentary. Go to Brave New Films and check that out. And we'll see you tomorrow with a lot more news. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.